Welcome to SciTech Culture with Steve Kern and Ben Warner, where we examine science, technology, and culture in the 21st century. Visit our website at scitechculture.com. So there's so much going on uh, these days, um, you know, uh, between um, all the tech stuff and everything that we've talked about in the past, Steve, um, you know, uh, Vision Pro and all of that coming out, which we'll talk about a bit later. But I thought it might be a a good chance to, um, you know, take a step back and uh, have a look at uh, some ancient history because I stumbled across across this story about archaeologists hunting for Cleopatra's tomb, ended up finding a what they called a geometric miracle tunnel um, in the city of Tapot. Tapasiris, I think it's called, Magna, on the Egyptian coast. And um, the reason why I like this, I'll I'll get to this in a minute when I sum it all up, obviously, but um, I'm always fascinated by this stuff. You know, this idea that um, ancient civilizations um, actually... um, did do some um, really interesting feats of engineering and probably the pyramids are an excellent example um, of that. Um, and obviously, um, this is another example where um, it se- seemed like it w- its use was to like funnel water, <coughs> um, you know, underneath um, whatever it is that they, were, that they were doing there. And it kind of has, um, you know, sort of a connection with like some like aqueduct technology, maybe in um, ancient Rome, <coughs> the Greeks had something as well. And... Um, that it's quite remarkable when you think about it in terms of human ingenuity or whatever that um, even at that stage we had the ability to work some of this stuff out so that if, despite the fact that you know the Egyptians had all these gods and everything and that they were looking at all these things and had a kind of mindset that was radically different I guess to what modern civilization is there still seemed to be a mathematical underpinning um, to um, all of these uh, structures that they built and all of that, even if they got, went about it a different way, um, obviously with different types of tools or whatever, um, kind of underlying that the universal language of mathematics and science is, still applies in that sense that it um, still worked that way. So I fe- that's why I like it. That, this story kind of jumped out at me as being really interesting and fascinating. Another reminder of you know how these things are. Oh, absolutely, and uh, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, since the universe has come into existence, the laws of math and physics have uh, remained unchanged. So, uh, you know, the math they were using is the math we use today, um, and the, the laws of physics required to create tunnels or structures uh, like that have not changed in not just 5,000 years, but uh, probably, you know, 13 billion years. So it's it's quite amazing really uh, when we see these things but we often forget I think how advanced uh, these these uh, ancient civilizations or, or uh, classical civilizations could have been um, because math is math and so uh, while they might not have invented uh, you know rockets or jet engines or uh, computer chips the math for uh, architecture is completely possible Remember, in uh, ancient Greek times, they uh, basically uh, came up with the Antikythera uh, mechanism, which is uh, effectively an analog computer, from what we can tell. Um, And what you might think is that while doing these mathematical calculations to build these tunnels or structures might have been laborious for one person, a team of skilled mathematicians, maybe 100, maybe 200, sitting down could probably calculate these things very effectively and very accurately. And uh, I think the the analogy for that also is you go back uh, 60 years and uh, think about uh, what was happening at NASA, a whole group of very talented uh, mathematicians, engineers and physicists were uh, working with slide rules and uh, they were able to send someone to the moon, uh, principally because they had that extra technology. So, yeah. I don't think it's aliens. I think it's, uh, you know, good old human know-how. Yeah, and that brings me to my second point about the aliens, only because I love social media and how um, these things pop up that, um, oh, you know, like uh, the, the graphic um, on a post that shows um, a UFO over the top of a pyramid, so it must have been um, aliens helped them out um, because, you know, there's no possible way that humans could have come up with this stuff um, way back then. Um, and I just find um, a lot of that amusing. I mean, it's kind of um, good for... Um, 
I don't know, um, a film or something, you know, to have a bit of fun. Uh, but um, sometimes the simplest explanation is off, often the right one. And although it's not as sexy to think that, oh, well, we just knew how to do it back then and then somehow through history we forgot it, but then we relearned it again using other tools and other, another, you know, another interpretation of the language of it so we understand it more kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, it's not good for, um, you know, circulating social media posts, I guess. Well, I mean, and there's a certain irony in that, isn't there? You know, uh, you can send a video from one side of the planet across the internet, so send images to someone sitting on the other side of the planet who magically sees them through a screen with we don't really understand how any of it works. Yet we don't think that's a miracle. And yet <laughs> building a stone building, you know, oh, 5,000 years ago, oh, that's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Just like we're doing now, this is all a miracle how we're doing yeah, this right now. Exactly. It has to be alien technology. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, oh, don't even get me started on the, you know, maybe the whole Roswell thing. Maybe that's how all the computer chips started because they, um, you know, uh, reverse engineered anything that they discovered there. I'm that's sure that's yeah, circulating. Those, those strange metals that don't occur on this planet or anywhere else in the universe because they're not on the periodic table. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, changing tack here completely, um, and obviously it's the, you know, we're still in the new year. Obviously, we've passed the happy new year stage well and truly, but obviously a lot of uh, people would have um, resolutions around losing weight or, you know, staying healthy or whatever. Um, and I, um, I came across this other story about intermittent fasting, for weight loss and obviously there's various different ways you can do it you know whether it's like time restricted or um you know or like say within a day or maybe you um eat less on two days and eat the rest on the other five days or you do like a you know a, a 16 10 type thing where you um eat for 10 hours but you don't eat for the other 16 there's all different permutations of that but it's interesting um that um you know it, it comes back down to um you know consuming fewer calories than we burn um so if, so if you do um i don't know if you take um the um you know you only eat between midday and 6 p.m um and you don't eat the rest of the time that alone is not going to do it if um you you know have about six pizzas in that um uh in that six hour window or um have lots of uh dessert or whatever that's not gonna that's not gonna cut it so um you have to really think about how you're doing it and obviously um there's a component of exercise in there as well although obviously what you eat is probably the most important thing because um you know um that's going to contribute to that but you know you got to think about it very carefully um in terms of how you do it oh you well you do i just find it quite funny that people seem to think that somehow uh you could lose weight potentially by um not consuming less calories than you burn it's just uh it's, it's the laws of physics we've just been talking about for the ancient egyptians and ancient greeks it's it's basically what goes in if, it, if it's not coming out then uh it's going on and and what i think is most interesting about uh the whole concept of dieting or fasting when they talk about calories is people just tend to think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, you know, I'm not going to eat more than 1,500 calories today or 800 calorie maximum today. But actually, the real, the real way you have to think about it is over the course of a week. So you have to calculate what calories you'll burn in the course of a week and then basically match your, I guess, calorie intake. And you can do that by intermittent fasting or just restriction or just not eating or whatever you want to term it so that at the end of the week you've actually consumed less calories rather than in one day. I mean, obviously it will work on a day-to-day -day basis, but the idea that um, somehow that it comes down to a day, it's actually it's actually scalable. So over time, and, and you could work it theoretically, you know, over the course of a month, you know, uh, and, and that's where this comes from. And if you do it, then, uh, you know, generally you'll feel much better, much healthier, and uh, the weight will come off. Hmm. And I'm a, and also there's a component of picking the right foods to eat as well. So, you know, foods that probably satiate you for longer, you know, like, you know, eating a piece of salmon might do that for you, not six donuts, for instance. Um. <laughs> <laughs> six donuts would be more filling. But I guess, you know, the thing is, is it's really 
when when you start to look at it on a week by week basis, for instance, then it becomes about lifestyle, and it becomes about you know what do you eat exactly as you're saying over that week to achieve all the things that you want to achieve through your diet, and that can be health, it can be pleasure, it can include all of those things when you look at it over a week. If you just talk about well, I'm not going to eat anything on Wednesdays and Fridays, that's uh, not much to look forward to, is it? And uh, <laughs> yeah, isn't it a, isn't it a habit forming thing as well? Like you don't want to like um, because because there's even psychological component of it too. Because you don't want to feel like you're denying yourself because that's going to sabotage your psychological approach to it. And, and that's why we talk about lifestyle. So the idea is is that you want to have a lifestyle that looks like this for food. And you know you might have the one day where you do eat your six donuts if you can fit that in under your calorie limit. <laughs> You know, the other thing is, is that, you know, people uh, struggle, I think, you know, with fasting a lot of the time because they feel hungry. But once you learn that hunger and learn that routine, it's it's actually not that difficult. But it's a lifestyle change because if really all you want to do is eat food and lots of it and the wrong foods, then um, you don't really want to change. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all those combinations, all those things that, uh, they tell you about when it comes to dieting and um, yeah but you just got to eat less <laughs> that's the key <laughs> absolutely absolutely all right and we'll uh, change tech completely again um, mentioned the vision pro before quickly um, that's um Pre-orders went out for that, I believe, next week. This is all only in America. No other countries are getting them at the moment. And the um, the actual units are going out to people, um, I believe, next week. Um, and then I guess we'll start to see um, use cases develop, I guess, for how people use them. This seems to me the most expensive beta testing um, product um, that Apple or anyone has ever released, um, you know, 3500 US dollars for, for one of these things for the base model, because you know, that's not just the base model, of course, or all the other accessories that you have to buy. Um, I'll get to some of the experiences that have been announced in, in a minute. But um, the thing that kind of uh, I find funny with this is, um, is just, um, it seems like this product it's it's not quite like the iPhone. Like you know, there was a lot of um, you know back and forth when the iPhone came out. Oh, it doesn't have a keyboard, so people aren't going to like touching on a touch screen. It doesn't have um, uh, the apps. Oh, maybe it's good for playing your music, but it's not a good corporate phone. And there was a lot of criticism around that. But that very quickly turned around once it went out into the public. The App Store was introduced, and now, and the rest is history. Now it's the do, like it's a dominant platform. Is how you would use a phone. This seems doesn't quite seem to have that. Um, look, I might be wrong. Um, it might turn into something. I can, and I think we mentioned before. I I have seen a future potentially, maybe in fifteen years' time, maybe unless they can figure out the technology sooner, where it becomes like a pair of glasses, um, and you know, isn't like you know over half a kilo strapped to your head um but it seems to me that um you know there's a reason why certain you know tech products have lasted the test of time and it's not just because something's old like a a keyboard is a great example why are we still using keyboards would be a, a classic example but there's a reason why we still keep using them so yes they're trying out this um particular product but where it actually goes i think is going to be a long gestating process and it's not going to become i don't think a dominant platform if if at all you know anytime soon well let's face it i mean if we wanted to be brutal we'd just say it's another recycling of 3d experiences you know uh and that's the best use case they've got at the moment i i think you've summed it up pretty well i think the reality i'm a bit more hopeful for it i think they'll shrink it down eventually I think they're probably still very nervous after Google Glass uh, and what happened there, and nobody really wants to see anyone running around with a pair of spectacles with this sort of capability. But I I think the use case will be augmented. I think what will happen in the future is we'll start wearing these and perhaps the work-from-home scenario will drive this. So rather than sitting in front of a screen, you know, you can – be standing there uh, or sat, sat there with these on your head and, you know, zooming or you're actually interacting if you're in a work environment, uh, which may be, you know, operational where you're having to make choices. Uh, 
in some sort of production scenario, then, you know, these glasses may help keep you safe, help you make the right choices, help you be more efficient. So, but that that's not, I guess, this version of the Vision Pro. I'm talking about the use cases down the track. And I think this is the stepping stone. But yeah, it's um, it really is a product in looking looking for a solution <laughs> oh and that's not to say that it's not um some of the entertainment options on it aren't intriguing like the idea that um you know you can like disney plus um actually um uh expanded its um actual um interaction in the vision pro app uh version of the app that it's got so um it's not just you're seeing um the ipad version uh you know projected in front of you it's actually an immersive um environment that they've created and um they've also got and they've also got a whole bunch of 3d films in there that um you know that they can um you can uh, it might potentially have a better experience than actually watching it in the cinema because it's such an immersive uh, platform but even some of the like 2d movies the traditional 2d movies could be blown up you know or give you the feeling that you're sitting in an imax size screen um with these goggles on and then of course there's other things like i can imagine that um there'd be a lot of use cases where you could like be transported somewhere um you know um you could walk on the moon go and you, you know all those things that we've talked about before um i think that even the hololens back in the day was doing which was um you know it puts you in you know to other countries maybe if you can't travel or something like that i find that kind of stuff intriguing but it's hard at the moment you know it costs 3500 bucks um and it would have to come down a lot um over the next couple of years for that sort of use case to um become a bit more mainstream yeah I, that's why i look to the augmented platforms it, it's got to create new value so I, I don't think as an entertainment platform on its own it creates new value i don't th- you know anything any game we can play in 2d well you could play it in three same with a movie you could watch it in two you can watch it in three but it doesn't does it really create new value well, not really, because especially in a movie, it's the story that counts, not the not so much just the uh, visual effects. But I think when it allows me to interact with an environment at a level that I can't presently, then I think it creates value. And that's where I think the augmented, particularly in a professional sense or a work-related sense, that's where I think it really... Uh, has exciting potential as recreation uh, i don't know i just don't know yeah well i guess it's not ready player one um at this stage anyway um although you know we're not living in a post-apocalyptic environment either where we'd want to hide um inside our goggles not yet <laughs> <laughs> absolutely all right steve we might wrap it up there um yeah interesting times um uh I'll, I'll have a it'll be interesting to see some of the um you know i'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, review videos coming out on the vision pro and i'm actually interested to, to see how they actually translate the experience of the vision pro into a youtube video for instance how's that gonna um actually work um other aside from the person just describing it to you let's just put it that way that's right (laughs) absolutely all right so um that's it for uh today's episode um and we'll catch you next time